Hi, I'm Billy Mitchell of FedScoop TV. Today I'm here with Seth Marcus, the Acting Deputy Director of the HRSA Data Warehouse at HHS. How are you, Seth? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for inviting me today, Billy. It's, a, it's our pleasure to have you here. Um, today we're at the Lowering the Cost of Government with IT Summit, our seventh ever. Um, and we're talking a lot about modernizing the IT infrastructure. And I wanted to know first off, you know, how can agencies best accomplish that goal of modernization um, while also ensuring that those investments also save some costs in the long run? Uh, sure. Well, first, let me just mention that uh, the opinions are mine and not necessarily those of my employer or my agency. Um, but uh, one of the key things that need to get done is just kind of modernize a lot of that old legacy technology. There's still a lot of mainframes out there. There's still a lot of COBOL systems, still a lot of client server systems that are not internet enabled. And the maintenance costs for those are just keep going higher and higher and higher. And it's just unsustainable. Um, and it's a real challenge. I've been in that situation before. Uh, at prior agencies, I've seen you know several attempts to modernize major financial systems off of uh, mainframes and onto a web-based uh, pr provider. And it's just really complex. They're interconnected with a lot of other systems. Uh, they have very complex business rules and they're being used millions of times a day. And you can't just take them offline for two years while you build a new system. And so they have to be, have a continuity of, of support. But you really need to get those systems modernized uh, uh, and by hook or by crook. You got to find a way to get them off in some, some new technology. And once you get one or two of them done, you can recycle those cost savings uh, into the next re-engineering project. And you can have a snowballing effect, a cascade effect. Um, hopefully, you, uh, agencies can start moving in that direction. A lot of them are. Uh, but we've just got to find a way to accelerate that. Certainly, with the uh, security concerns of today, um, some of those legacy systems are just not as secure as the, the more modern technology. Um, and we just have to find a way to move those things forward and, and advocate for them and get the, uh, the buy-in from the executive leadership that we really need to make these things happen. I'm glad you mentioned uh, security, cybersecurity, because um, my next question has to do with the budgeting for cybersecurity. Do you think that's something that there needs to be more focus on, is making sure the money's there so these systems, whether they're old or new, are protected? Oh, absolutely. Just one more point on the last question is just the other thing that agencies could, could do is just take a look at your contracts. Um, and we need to take a look at the uh, deliverables and the tasks in the contract and try to get rid of some of the things that we don't need anymore. There's maybe support that we don't need. There may be other um, uh, delivery vehicles that we just don't, don't need or don't use or, or a way we can, we can slim them down. Um, and so by taking a fresh look at our contracts, that's one other way that we can start looking at you know, shaving some money off and, and, and releasing that for the re-engineering. But as far as the uh, security goes, in terms of finding, financing security, yeah, there's absolutely a, a need to refocus and, and put some more resources over there. I mean, clearly we had a wake-up call uh, recently about that. Um, and I think people are uh, working really hard uh, to reassign resources, to reallocate resources, um, put the right people in the right place who can actually start uh, getting these technical security controls closed as well as the, on the policy side to make sure that we're living up to the policies. Um, and to do the technical stuff is really sometimes not all that hard. It's you know putting in the two-factor authentication, putting in the encryption. Those type of things uh, are not technically difficult. A lot of them are, are really have been solved. It's just a matter of how do we put them in in a way that um, doesn't throw chaos to the customers and to the users and how do we change the culture to a much more security focused culture so that I think we're moving in that direction but how do we accelerate that? How do we get people to, you know, not just at the technical level or the manager level but also at the executive level uh, to make sure that they're fully briefed on security and they're fully aware and engaged and it's not just a buy-in but it's also a be-in. They need to be in the room and they need to see the dashboards and see the security controls getting ticked off and checked off as we start going through mm -hmm. and authenticating our, our systems and certifying our systems. Sure. Now what about cybersecurity in the cloud? Um, often people talk about cloud as a driver of efficiency, maybe some cost savings related there, but what about cloud as a force multiplier for cybersecurity? Well, that's a great question. Uh, people are, there is sort of a, a stigma that the cloud is going to be unsecure or it's going to release the information. But when you look at the legacy data centers that we have all over the place, a lot of those aren't really secure either, to be honest. Um, I moved a major system to a cloud environment, and uh, we, when I saw what was under the hood and how they were 
supposedly protecting the systems and the data, I mean, it really wasn't being done. Um, and so when we moved our system to the FedRAMP approved uh, cloud provider, we actually closed a whole bunch of security weaknesses that we didn't even know we had. Um, and on the physical side, the actual physical protection of the servers, uh, we, there were much better controls in place uh, of that. Um, and on the policy side and the technical side, in terms of managing the servers, um, here's one example of how that was better uh, in terms of the backup servers. So in the old way of doing things in the legacy data center, uh, if we had to switch to the contingency environment, we have to drive to the data center, unplug the servers, plug them back in, do a lot of manual processes. It would take about a day and a day of disruption for the customers. Um, in the cloud environment, we can do that in about five minutes. Uh, we can switch over to the cloud uh, contingency servers in about five minutes with, with literally almost no interruption to the customer. Um, the other thing that we can do in the cloud is it it's really built for the automated monitoring. Um, where you're looking at the network, and you're looking at the traffic going in and out, the transactions. Um, not just a, a person is doing it, but there are automated tools and fraud detection tools that are running continuously, and you get alerts fired when something out of range happens. Mm -hmm. And that's really the key, be key benefit of the virtualized uh, servers that the cloud can provide to you. We didn't have that capability in the past, so um, we're, we have better protections than we had in the past in the legacy data center. And also we have these automated tools running much more frequently, uh, so we're alerted in real time if there's a po possible attack. And there are things that we might not have known about uh, for months in the past, but now we can get alerted immediately and switch over and take immediate proactive steps if something were to happen. Yeah. And finally, big data is something that a lot of people rave about being a solver of many problems. Um, but specifically, I wanted to ask you, you know, how, how does big data affect cybersecurity and then also the topic of a lot of things we're talking about here today, lowering the cost of government? Well, I think big data, you know, being involved in a, um, a big business intelligence data warehouse type project across a, uh, parts of HHS, um, I see the benefits every day. I mean, when you take, uh, you know, they say a, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, a map is sometimes worth a thousand lines of a spreadsheet. Um, and when you see the data visually on a, on a graph or a chart or a map or, or any type of visualization, uh, it tells a much better story. Um, and I think it, it, when, you, when you pull that information in automatically, um, uh, there's a big value that's gained when you can uh, present to an executive, here's the situation of what's going on in this program or in this division or in this uh, budget line item. Um, in real time, uh, using automated solutions, uh, it's very powerful. And it's th things that like in the past would, would have that 31 flavors of Excel spreadsheets data call where you get thir 31 different people sending information in on Excel spreadsheets and someone's got to spend two weeks compiling it together and double checking it and reconciling it. All that stuff can be automated um, if you build the business, business intelligence databases and the, and the business intelligence tools and visualization tools uh, the right way. Um, so I'm a big advocate for that technology. I think that uh, that's somewhere where uh, agencies are moving, they're moving forward, um, but we've got to keep accelerating those type of projects going forward. And in terms of security, again, the automated tools can help you with those things. You can set up dashboards. A lot of the cloud services even have a management panel with dashboards showing what's going on with each server instance um, and how much traffic is going through. You can do the load balancing automatically um, that way. Uh, but the other thing is with the automated tools in terms of security is it helps you identify some of the anomalies. Um, you can take a look at the user accounts and find out what, where there's suspicious data in the user accounts and you could start flagging those for further investigation. If you have a million users on your account, <clears throat> there's no way you can do that manually. Um, the other way to do it is, is just uh, deleting the accounts that are inactive. Again, if you have a million uh, user accounts and some of them get deactivated every month, <clears throat> you just turn them off. Well, Seth, all great answers. That's all I have for you, though. I appreciate you taking the chance to uh, talk to us today. Well, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks so much. Yeah, awesome. I'm Billy Mitchell with FedScoop TV. Thanks for watching.